This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. In Chapter 4, we start to deal with the tax-adjusted trading profit of the individual unincorporated trader. This could be for a sole trader, it could be for a partnership. The chapter we were dealing with comes in two main parts. The most important part deals with this, and that, let's make the pen work, is the adjustment of an accounting profit based on the net profit as per the statement of profit or loss, and making it acceptable for taxation purposes. Something we discussed back in our introduction, indeed, to the subject of income tax. Trading income is covered in some five chapters, the next five chapters that we have to deal with. So it's a big, big area. But in this chapter, we look at, and again, the main issue, as I've said, hugely examinable area, is how do we carry out that process of adjusting up the accounting profit and making it acceptable for tax? Notice we say adjusting. We do not prepare an entirely new taxation profit and loss account. We take at the bottom of the statement of profit or loss, the net profit as per the accounts, and adjust it for taxation purposes. Adjustment means doing one of two things, either adding to it, increasing it, or taking away from it, decreasing it. And what are we going to adjust for? Well, principally, one major area, and that is the expense items listed out on the statement of profit or loss, where those expenses, perfectly allowable in terms of accounting, but may not be allowable either in part or sometimes even in full in relation to taxation. And that's the second part of this particular chapter. Now, the first part of the chapter is very brief and okay, it's in the syllabus, but it is nowhere near as important in exam terms as is the adjustment of profit, which gets regularly tested. This is more a one-off area, but it's still an issue that we need to deal with. And it refers to, as you see here, the badges of trade. We are assuming that when something is sold, trading with something is sold, that that act of sale is trading. It's a trading transaction. But what these notes will tell you, and we'll be discussing in just a few minutes' time, is how do we distinguish trading where we have, we buy, we sell, with what might instead be a capital transaction. With a capital transaction, a capital asset, you buy it, you sell it, but you don't make a trading profit thereon, you make a capital gain. And that capital gain computed using the rules of CGT, which we see in chapter 12 and thereafter, we calculate that gain and it is then subject to CGT. So we have to have rules, what we call badges here, of trade, which say these are the issues that we're looking for to determine that something is indeed a trading transaction rather than a more one-off capital transaction. Now, so far as these areas are concerned, the vast majority of them have not changed since, well, since I was a boy indeed there. And trust me, that is a very long time ago. So what you're going to see for the majority of this particular chapter is recordings made back in 2018 in relation to the Finance Act of 2017. Now, there's only one error in terms of adjustment of profit that has changed. And what you'll discover at the end of this particular first lecture out of the two that we have for Chapter 4 contains a new bit where I deal with the issue that has changed something which is also tagged onto it. It hasn't changed, but again, so it will pick up with your next lecture, the second one, which is all Finance Act of 2017. The rules for badges of trade have not changed. The vast majority of the rules for how do we take an accounting profit and adjust it up for taxation, the adjustment of profit process, that hasn't changed either. Where it has, as I've said, there will be at the end of this lecture, the first of the two, a new bit that has been introduced. Other than that, it's all from the 2018 recordings. So again, in a moment's time, you'll be seeing me a few years ago.
Ah, that young, bright person as once I was. So, uh, enjoy those lectures with the, I'd say the old myth, the younger the there. And at the end of this one, we'll come back and we'll do the one bit that has effectively changed. I look forward to seeing you in a few moments. Back in chapter two, we saw that the two main sources of income, earned income at least for taxpayers, are going to be either employment income or for the self-employed, the trading profits of their unincorporated trades. What we're now going to look at is the detail that pertains to establishing what that trading income assessment will be. What figure of trading income, trading profit, will we include on the income tax computation for the relevant tax year for our taxpayer? And this exercise is going to cover an awful lot of ground. Chapter 4 through to chapter 8 is going to involve dealing with the unincorporated trader. There's a lot going on. The first problem that we have to get over, which is basically a given in terms of the main core exam questions that you get, is we're talking about the self-employed as trading. Trading presumably implies we buy and we sell things, goods or services there. That's trading, you're buying and selling things. But what we have is an initial problem that needs to be resolved. When you sell something, does the profit that you make, we hope profit that you make on that sale, does that represent a trading profit or something we spoke of in our introduction? Does it actually represent a profit on the disposal of an asset that gives rise to a chargeable gain? Is it trading? Now, that distinction is a matter of rules that need to be applied and that have been tested through case law over the years. But they're known here as the badges of trade, the so-called badges of trade. Now, again, there's all sorts of ways by which this could be tested in terms of a Section A objective testing question, identifying which of these would be badges of trade. In Section C, it could be a written question whereby you have to discuss the implications of various transactions and identify whether you consider them to be trading or whether you consider them to be capital in nature. So what do we look at? Now, no one of these tests would say, yeah, that's trading or Ooh, no, that's capital. That's a capital gain when you sell the asset. What we've got to look at is the balance of things. Now that makes it practically difficult to go out with an evaluation. So it's going to be pretty obvious in terms of any exam question, should you have to apply these badges of trade. But initially, we need to have a knowledge of what they are. And overall, whether or not therefore it represents trading or whether it represents a capital disposal and a capital gain. Let's have a look at what we've got here. The first test that we have, the first badge of trade, we look at the subject matter. Whether a person is trading or not, sometimes by looking at the subject matter of the transaction. Now, that one I'll come back to in a second, because other ones might seem more obvious, but we'll relate back to that. Frequency of transactions. Yeah, if you bought something four years ago and you sell it now, well, that would seem to be capital. That's not trading. If you bought something last week and you sell it this week, that seems rather more trading. And frequency of transactions, so that's also length of ownership there. Frequency of transactions, if I've made one transaction in four years, it doesn't really look like trading. If I'm making transactions every week, I buy and sell each week, then that looks rather more like trading. So there are two obvious ones, frequency of transactions and the length of ownership. But frequency of transactions, there you'd say, if I'm doing this a lot, it looks like trading. If it's a one-off, that, that looks like capital. But that's when we bring in this one about subject matter. There's a classic case that is usually quoted in just about every text here. A situation where an individual had one transaction, bought one million toilet rolls. Mm, bought one million toilet rolls and then proceeded to sell those toilet rolls. Now, he tried to maintain that because it was just a transaction, we bought in one go, we didn't buy anything else, that was it, that that was not trading. 
But when we looked at the subject matter, we think, so hang on a minute, why did you buy these toilet rolls? We've got to look at, do we think there was a profit motive involved there? And why did we have that? If you bought something that is for your own pleasure, as it were, a work of art, a painting, it goes on the wall and you think, yeah, that's lovely. But two or three years later, maybe a year later, you think, you know what? I don't like that. Now there, there's no doubt about it, that that disposal would be seen as capital in nature. But the million toilet rolls, do we think we bought those for our own pleasure and own consumption? I don't think so. Why did he buy them? He bought them to be able to sell them at a profit. So that therefore was the profit motive. Uh, although the frequency of transactions wasn't there, the length of ownership didn't store these toilet rolls for very long, you'd be pleased to hear. But the subject matter, whether a person is trading, look at what you're dealing with. I had that picture on the wall, buy it, put it on the wall, maybe a month later. You know what? I don't like it. Plus the wife's told me she doesn't like it either, and that's the final decision. So it's got to go. It's not trading when I sell it, it's a capital item. But those one million toilet rolls I bought not with an intention to keep, although nowadays it could be modern art, I don't know, um, but the intention to sell and, of course, make a profit. So subject matter, frequency of transactions, length of ownership, profit motive, all of these make sense in the context of overall balance of what's going on. Is it trading or is it capital in nature? Another good test of trading, supplementary work, so you buy something, you do it up, you improve it there. Why are you doing that? With the intention of then selling it and making a profit. And marketing. So when the work is when work is done to make an item more marketable, or attempts are made to find purchasers, the transactions are more likely to be treated as a trade. Yeah, you buy something, you work on it, that therefore is trading manner in which the assets were acquired. Now we said that, uh, again, that if you uh, bought something and then quite quickly sold it, depending on the subject matter, that that might be viewed as being trading, the nearly a toilet rolls there. But the, look at the manner in which the assets were acquired. For example, acquired unintentionally. Sadly, someone close to you died, and they've left you as your inheritance these assets. But you don't want those assets. They have value and thankfully you can sell them, but you don't want to keep them. So then they're sold. Now that is not going to be looked at as trading. You had no intention to buy and sell those assets. They were given to you, sadly, as the result of someone's death. This was not a trading transaction. Just because the person who owned them, who sadly died, left them to you, just mean to say that you like them and therefore you sell them off, not trading. So we take an overall view. You need to be aware of what those particular badges of trade are and able to quote and potentially seek to reasonably apply. Again, other than that, be aware of them in case we get a course like an objective testing question, which of these are badges of trade or are not badges of trade. But by far the most important part of this chapter, and something that will be tested in every exam, whether it's section A, B or C, I don't know, but will be tested in absolutely every exam, is the adjusting of the accounting profit. We know for the self-employed that they're going to be taxed on their so-called adjusted trading profit. Because what HMRC say is that the accounting profit computed using perfectly normal and reasonable financial accounting principles. Though they may be perfectly fine for financial accounting, they are not acceptable for taxation purposes. And what we have to do is to adjust that accounting profit to make it acceptable for taxation purposes. We have to prepare an adjustment of profit statement, an adjustment of profit statement. Now, what we do not do here is to prepare an entirely new taxation PL account, an entirely new statement of taxable profit or loss. 
we adjust the existing accounting profit. So the starting point is the net profit as per the accounts. Now the net profit at the bottom of the statement of profit or loss is the result of crediting various sources of income or source of income as the case may be, principally sales, and debiting the purchases and other expense costs. What we have to do therefore is to look at each of those items and determine whether or not it should be a part of trading income. So for example, your net profit at the bottom of your statement of profit or loss. When you look at what's credited to that statement of profit or loss, you discover it's not just the sales there that have been credited, but there's other sources of income, like there's property income that has gone through there, interest income. Now those are indeed sources of taxable income, but they're separate sources. They're not trading income. You know on your income tax computation in chapter two, you're going to include things like property income, things like interest income. In chapter three, we've looked at how we derive the property income assessment. So what you have there, therefore, is separate sources of taxable income, but at the moment, they are a part of this net profit as per the accounts. Therefore, they have to come out. So the adjustment would be to deduct there uh, from the accounting profit any figures that are non-trading income. We won't get away with not being taxed on it, but they'll be taxed in their own right, on their own basis of assessment, separately on the income tax computation as interest income, as property income. So they must come out. Now, there may be one or two examples of that, but by far the main area of adjustment is looking at the expense items and determining whether or not all of those expense items debited on your accounts are acceptable for taxation purposes. And we will inevitably find, applying the rules that we need to now learn, that several of those expenses, either in part, sometimes in full, but usually in part, will not be allowable. So what do we have to do? We have to add them back. We add back non-allowable expenses. Remember, as we've said, our starting point is the net profit as per the accounts. You pick that up from the question, you look above the line of the net profit, any income sources that are not trading, we deduct because they shouldn't be a part of trading income, so out they come. And any expenses that have served to reduce that accounting net profit that are in fact not allowable for taxation, therefore should not have been deducted in deriving a taxable trading profit. What do we do with them? We add them back. So the main area there, or we're going to add back the expenditure that is not deductible there for tax, the non-allowable expenses. What we also do, as we've said, is to take out anything credited that is not trading income. Income accessible elsewhere, property income, interest income, as we have mentioned, or even non-taxable exempt income, like, well, sorry, like uh, income from an ISA, for example, there. So anything that is not taxable, either because it's exempt or though it is taxable, it's not trading income, it comes out. Now, again, I've given labels there. When you do your adjustment of profit statement, we always start with the net profit as per the accounts. But you don't then need to put and do not put subheadings as regards expenses not deductible for tax, items there that are not assessed as trading profit. You don't need headings. All we need to know going through each item on that statement of profit or loss is do we need to add any amount back? Do we need to deduct any amount from the net profit to derive our adjusted trading profit? What we'll also see when it comes to the exam questions is that if there is something that doesn't need any adjustment at all, you'll still have to include that in your adjustment of profit statement 
but all you do is to write the item in and say zero. Again, the question tells you, exam questions will tell you to include every item listed there, made reference to in the statement of profit or loss and within the notes. And if it doesn't require adjustment, just put zero in. Not an add back, not a deduction, just zero. So everything needs to be accounted for in this adjustment of profit. OK, now that's the format, starting with the net profit as per the accounts, working down to the tax adjusted trading profit. But this bit in chapter four gets you to that point, the adjusted trading profit, the adjusted profit. Because what will happen as part of this adjustment of profit process? An expense item that you're well used to in terms of accounting, a depreciation charge, is not, surprisingly, an allowable deduction for taxation. Now, I say surprisingly, because what is depreciation? It's writing off the cost of an asset over its useful economic life, an asset used within the trade. So you'd think that that would be a perfectly normal and allowable trading expense. But it's not allowed. Now, it's not that the HMRC are mean and won't, don't want to give us any tax relief here. What it is, is that depreciation is too subjective, it's too variable. You could have any depreciation policy you liked. I'll have 1% reducing balance, 50% straight line. You could have any method you like and change it from one year to the other. So what HMRC do and sensibly do is to say, we're not going to leave it to you to determine what tax relief you get for the capital expenditure that you incur. What we will do is to give you tax relief, all of you, our way. And our way is capital allowances. So up here in the add back of expenditure not deductible for tax, what will loom large will be depreciation, as we will see soon. We will add back depreciation. And what replaces it down here is capital allowances. But that's a huge area in its own right. Chapter five, a much more substantial chapter than this chapter four, will show us how to compute and then deduct those capital allowances. Once you've got that tax adjusted trading profit, then the next problem is how do I relate that tax adjusted trading profit based on whatever accounting period the individual has decided to prepare their accounts for? What, how do you know how to assess that? I've got a tax adjusted trading profit for an accounting period but I need to assess those profits in a tax year. Now, when we looked at this at chapter two, we said that for every source of income, there was a basis of assessment. And most of them were simple, like a received basis. Employment income, received. Dividends, received there. Interest, received. Sensible, simple bases of assessment. But when it came to your self-employed persons and their tax-adjusted trading profit, you could look at what was received. We needed some way to relate any given accounting period to the tax year in which it would be assessed. Now, I wonder if you remember what that basis of assessment I told you was going to be. We abbreviated it to an acronym by the letters CYB. You remember what those stand for? I hope so. It was current year basis. Well, don't worry if you couldn't remember that, because in chapter six, after doing here, adjustment of profits, in chapter four, capital allowances in chapter five, we get that tax adjusted trading profit here. How do we then relate it to the tax year in which it will be assessed? We look at the basis and bases of assessment that apply so far as our trading profits are concerned. And there's a lot of detail going in there. The basic CYB is a simple process for any tax year, we assess the tax adjusted trading profit of the accounting year ended in the current tax year. But where life gets way more interesting was where you deal with a new trade, commencement to trade, or a cessation of trading. But that's chapter six. All right. Always be careful to start with the net profit as per the accounts. It will be clearly identified. You pick that up as your starting point. Now, 
This process of adjustment to profits, now that we've got the objective testing, the multiple choice questions there, um, can be tested in different ways. You could get still a written question, section C. We know that one of the 15 mark questions will be on income tax and another 15 mark question, the other 15 mark question will be on corporation tax. And self-employed individuals and of course trading companies, they will have trading income. So both in income tax that we're dealing with now and then later in your studies, corporation tax, you'll still have to do this process, adjusting up the accounting profit to make it acceptable for taxation. Computing and deducting capital allowances and getting your tax adjusted trading profit, not just here in chapter four and chapter five for an individual, an unincorporated trader, but also for a company. So in either of those 215 mark questions, this process of adjustment of profits and computation and deduction of capital allowances could be tested. But equally in section A, any individual question, this adjustment for it lends itself to it very easily. They could just give you a cross section of expense items and say which of these are allowable, what is the allowable amount, or what would be the add back in relation to non allowable expenses. So, very easily tested either as part of a larger written question in section C or any individual uh, adjustment of profit items tested in section A. So what are the rules, therefore, that we need here to know? Let's have a little look over the page. And we see all the way down this page and across indeed to the next page, lots of different expense items made reference to here that we now have to deal with. Right. Now, again, at the end of the day, you need to sit down and learn the adjustment of profit rules. They're not going to go away. And when you do it, in principle, you are killing, as it were, two birds with one stone, as the old saying goes, because you are doing work that could be tested either in income tax or in corporation tax. When we get to corporation tax, you'll see that there are a few differences. If anything, the adjustment of profits for corporate tax is easier than it is for income tax. So you'll find that very simple when we come to is chapter 16 dealing with corporation tax there. But the rules that we learn here, most of them, we're learning rules that we could use either in income or in corporate tax. There is a need to know. This area will be tested. Any marks? I don't know, but it will be tested. Right, what have we got? Looking at the typical items that we might see. First of all, capital expenditure. Now then, capital expenditure including depreciation, is not allowable. Now, we're thinking, well, hang on a minute, it's a statement of profit loss. Capital expenditure shouldn't be there. It should only be revenue expenditure. But we might see an item such as labelled as repairs. Now, repairs sound like it's a revenue expense and should be allowable. But for tax purpose, we need to say, is indeed that the repair to an asset, because that would be revenue expenditure allowable? Or is it the improvement of an asset and therefore capital expenditure are not allowable. If it's capital expenditure and it is on qualifying plant and machinery, then although we'll add it back as a non-allowable expense here in the adjustment of profit, it'll be compensated for by getting capital allowances there on. But I'll remind you of this on chapter five, just because expenditure is classified as capital does not mean that you automatically get capital allowances. Capital allowances, as you will discover, are only available on qualifying plant and machinery. So capital expenditure does not equal capital allowances. Qualifying capital expenditure equals capital allowances. But here, if debited on your statement of profit or loss is a capital expenditure amount, it is improving an asset, it is adding to an asset, then that is not allowed and will be added back. If all we're doing is repairing it, returning it to its normal working condition, for example, uh, we've got our business premises and we redecorate those business premises. They were decorated before, we redecorate, it deteriorates, we, we redecorate. That's a repair item, normal repairs and maintenance. 
For anything that's an enhancement, an improvement, we add an extension to the property, for example, then no, that is capital and that therefore is disallowed. Equally as we've said, depreciation or depreciation by any other name. Now, as we've said, what replaces this, we get tax relief for capital expenditure, it's capital allowances. But depreciation, again, if given, it's usually just quoted depreciation. But if you've got a loss on the sale of an asset, a profit on disposal of assets, all of those must come out in the adjustment of profit process. The reason being, a loss or a profit on the disposal of an asset simply means that you've either under or overcharged depreciation, which of itself is not allowable. Therefore, depreciation and back, debit loss on disposal of asset, not allowable add back. So depreciation, loss on disposal of asset, add them back. Profit on disposal of asset, it's not taxable income and therefore and when it's credited, it comes out. You deduct that in the adjustment of profits. So watch out there. Depreciation is always going to come through, but watch out for losses on disposals of assets, profits on disposals of assets. They're just under or overcharging of depreciation. Relief, such as qualifying loan interest payments, see Chapter 2. Um, there was a list of qualifying loan interest payments. What happened there was they were deductions from your total income. They were not an expense to be deducted in deriving a single source of income like your trading income there. And that's the point that we make here. What we'll tend to find though is the sort of interest that we'll see is probably more likely to be normal trading uh, loan interest. So if you look down here, interest payable, Interest paid on borrowings for trading purposes, that is allowable. On an accrual basis, no adjustment is needed. Although there's been debited in the statement of profit or loss there, that will also be allowable there for taxation. Things like uh, your overdraft interest on your account. That, to do with trading, that is allowable. There's no disallowance there. Just uh, going back to the list so as not to miss any of these out. Um, probably more likely to be seen in a corporate tax context, but if you are using someone's patent in your production, uh, in your organisation, patent royalties payable of an allowable deduction. Of course, they're a trading expense. You, someone has patented a process, you therefore have to pay a royalty every time you produce one of your products. Fine, that is a trading expense. What gets tested more, rather more often is dealing with bad debts, irrecoverable, or as the word is these days, impaired debts. If you've written off a trade debt, it's an impairment, then as per accounting, the tax treatment follows the accounting treatment and it will be allowable. However, any non-trade write-offs are not allowable, so the expense would be added back. So, for example, you're told that you've written off uh, a customer debt who went into uh, liquidation and therefore could not pay. Fine, trading debt, write it off, it's an allowable deduction. So, no adjustment of profit required. But you're also told that you wrote off uh, £200, which was a loan to an employee when the employee left your employment without having repaid the loan. That's not trade. It's not in your trade there to lend money to employees and then have to write it off when they don't pay you back. So on that basis, therefore, it would be disallowable. So it's got to be on a, a trading item. Um, this one, oh, comes up all the time. A very common one. Not that it's a common expense item in real life, certainly not in these days, but entertaining and gifts. Entertaining is disallowed unless it's entertaining employees. So if you entertain your own staff, Christmas party, for example, there, 
then those expenses are allowable trading profit deductions. So no need to add them back. If you're entertaining uh, uh, customers, for example, which probably the most likely group of people, then such entertainment of customers is uh, not allowable. So entertaining is disallowed unless it's employees. Gifts to employees are allowable. Again, when you provide these benefits to employees, what we will do is to look in Chapter 9 at employment income to see whether the individual should be taxed on any element of those benefits provided. Now, they won't all be taxable, but some of them will, but that's for Chapter 9. Here, entertaining is disallowed unless it's entertaining employees allowable. Gifts to employees allowable, because in the context of those two, there's a possibility that we'll treat it as employment income. But that's chapter nine, and we'll see that later. The one that regularly comes up, gifts to customers, gifts to customers. Now here, you have to learn the rule. Only allowable if they've got a cost less than 50 pounds there per person per year, the person to whom you make the gift, cost less than 50 pounds per person per year, they must represent a conspicuous advertisement for the business. So you've got your business name emblazoned over it, hence the typical normal ones like a, a diary, for example, there with the business name embossed upon it. So cost less than 50 pounds, represent a conspicuous advert for the business, but must not be, and they then take out probably all the things that your customers would most likely like to be gifted, because it must not be food, drink, tobacco products, or exchangeable vouchers there. Any of those are a no-no. Doesn't matter whether they cost less than 50 pounds, they are not allowable. Now, you might say, well, uh, what about though, if you were, if you're in the food business or the drink business or the tobacco business, would then, if you provide what is your product to your uh, customers, would that be okay? Well, a gift, no. But not. I'm trying not to tell you how to get around tax here. But if, of course, you provided samples to your customers as a way of saying, try these and now I hope you will buy them, samples, that, the cost of those samples would be fine. But outright gifts, no. Where you draw the line and how HMRC might determine what is a sample and what is a gift, that's an entirely different matter. But if you're in the drinks business, you brought a new drink in, you provided samples to your uh, uh, customers there, then that would be seen as being, yeah, cost of samples, that is an allowable expense, it's not a gift, it is okay. But that one gets tested on a regular basis. So, cost less than £50 per person per year, must represent a conspicuous advert for the business, but must not be food, drink, tobacco products or exchangeable vouchers. Subscriptions and donations. Another one that comes up on a regular basis. Right. Any trade or professional association subscriptions there? If it's to do with the trade, then absolutely fine. You're practicing as an accountant, you pay your professional subscription each year. Again, that is fine. That would be an allowable deduction. Charitable donations. Now then, charitable donations may either be made, as you know, from uh, Chapter 2, under the gift aid system or not. We're talking here about charitable donations not made under the gift aid system. If they're made under the gift aid system, then they're not allowable. They will be added back in this, the adjustment of trading profit. The reason being, do we get tax relief on gift aid payments? Yes, we do, as we saw in chapter two. Basic rate relief at source, higher rate, and if necessary, additional rate relief by extension of the basic rate band and if necessary, the higher rate band. So they're already dealt with within the tax system. So on that basis, you're not gonna get tax relief again as a deduction 
as an expense item against your trading profit. So those therefore would be disallowed, those would be added back. So what about if it's not made under gift aid? Here might be allowable, might not be. What we have to look at, if it is small and made wholly and exclusively for trading purposes, for example, promoting your business name, and it's to a local charity, then it's allowable. If it's a small local charitable donation, by here, a permission of HMRC, it's not in the case law, but they will allow that to be allowable. So they won't therefore disallow. But if you're making a donation to a national or international charity, those will not be allowable. So if you've gifted to Oxfam, for example, they're an international charity, noble as it is, it's not going to be an allowable expense. Now, of course, if you were making such uh, donations to national or international charities, you don't need to show it as an expense item through the business because there's a very easy way of being able to get tax relief for it. Use the gift aid scheme. You shouldn't be doing it. But if you see that in your statement of profit or loss, then if it's small and local, allow it. So zero adjustment. If it's national or international, we disallow, we add it back. And whoever it is, if it's gift aid, whether it's small and local or not, doesn't matter. If it's paid, whoever it is paid to, whatever charity, if it's under gift aid, it's not allowable and it's added back. Another one that is not allowable, political donations there. I wouldn't suggest to which particular party you might be donating, but whoever it is, not allowable. Add it back. We move on, legal and professional charges. Uh, allowable if connected with the trade and not related to capital items. Now, again, uh, if uh, we're talking about Again, I suppose I can give you these specifically allowed by statute. A couple of ones that uh, again always come up. Cost of obtaining loan finance, allowable. Cost of renewing a short lease. Now, we've seen leases before in Chapter 3 there, and we know that there's issues pertaining to premiums paid and received on the granting of a short lease. But if you've got a cost here, a legal or professional charge, on the cost of, note that word, renewing a short lease, then that's allowed. Short lease, 50 years or less. Typical examiner's ploy here to see whether you've actually learnt that one properly. The typical one that they put through in an exam question is they tell you that here is a legal expense incurred in relation to acquiring a 30-year lease. Now, what did I say? legal expense in connection with acquiring a 30-year lease. Will that be allowable? Now, sadly, what some students see is just half the story. They say, oh, 30-year lease. That's a short lease. I'll remember that one. That one is specifically allowed. Mm, no. It's that word there, renewing. I said the cost of acquiring a 30-year lease. The cost of acquiring, that is a capital item and therefore is not going to be allowed. So it must be the renewal of a short lease. Up here we said allowable connected with the trade, legal expenses, for example, um, drawing up employment contracts there. That's to do with your trade. You need your employees uh, within your trade, so that would be fine. Uh, Sending out threatening letters to uh, uh, bad debtors there, people who haven't paid uh, a long outstanding uh, sum. So sending out bad, uh, trying to deal with bad debts, trying to collect, that type of uh, cost there, that legal expense, that'd be fine. So again, all of that would be to do with the trade. Again, that's a popular area. Well, briefly back to the present day, and it's this particular item in terms of our adjustment of profits, this lease rentals on cars here, where we see a change that has occurred over the last few years. This is our first 
detailed look at an issue that runs throughout taxation in terms of cars. In terms of a trader using a car within his or her trade, we may have two options. We may be using a car that the business has bought and the car that the business has bought, the cost of that would then go into the capital allowances system. So capital allowances would be available. And as you'll see in chapter five, there's more trouble in dealing with cars as regards capital allowances than anything else. And what you'll see there is a linkage to CO2 emissions as regards whether or not we get a bigger or a smaller amount of capital allowance. Basically, the lower the CO2 emissions, then the better it is for the planet and the better it is for you in terms of the tax relief that will be available. The higher the CO2 emissions, then the worse it is going to be for the planet and equally, therefore, the worse it will be for you in terms of what will be allowable. So what we have here is a very, very simple rule. They're all simple. The problem, of course, is learning them all. But lease rentals on cars with, now here's the cutoff, CO2 emissions exceeding 50 grams per kilometre. CO2 emissions exceeding 50 grams per kilometre. If we exceed 50 grams, then there's going to be an adjustment of profit. And as we've seen with all these expense items, it's about adding back the non-allowable expense. And here the add back is just a set figure. The disallowed amount is 15% of the leasing charges per annum there. Whatever the leasing charges are, we add back 15%. That is the disallowed amount. We increase that accounting profit by that figure. We'll see that 50 grams per kilometre again when it comes to the net chapter, chapter 5. And we deal there with the capital allowances system. So there is this distinction, therefore, between have you bought a car for use within the trade, so it's yours, or as here, are you simply lease renting, lease hiring that particular car, in which case it isn't yours, and what you're paying is a higher charge, and that expense goes through your profit or loss. It's not like the cost of a car when you buy it, this is an expense, the lease hire charge, and it goes through the profit and loss. It will be debited there on. And what you'll have in an exam question is a note as regards that lease hire charge telling you what the car was in terms of its CO2 emissions. And what you're looking for, as we've said, is that cutoff figure. And if, as is likely, the CO2 emissions exceed 50 grams per kilometre, get your calculator out, take 15% of that lease hire charge, and add that back. Now that's leasing a car. The next bit, which hasn't changed, uh, but uh, I need to cover now to feed into the next lecture, where again, we'll go back to me in my younger days, the Finance Act 2017 lecture recorded back in 2018, and deal with the remainder of the adjustment of profits areas, and also there, be looking in that uh, next lecture at an example to illustrate the application of these various rules in the adjustment of profit process. The only difference you'll find between the lecture and your updated study notes is that the accounting period in the lecture is a long time ago as compared to where it is now, but all the rules exactly the same. Let's just deal with this next one, therefore, where it does nothing new here, it is something you already know. Because we now turn our attention away from the lease hire leasing a car to now leasing a property. And looking specifically at, for a trader, the premium that may be paid on the granting of a lease on a property for the trader now to use within his or her trade. This is something that we looked at in chapter three. In chapter three, when we dealt with property income, we dealt with both sides of looking at the lessor and the lessee. We focused on the lessor because for the lessor, we were dealing with that's the person that owns the property and that's the person who gets the income, the property income from letting that property out. 
and it came in two forms. There was the uh, rental income that would arise over the period of the lease, while the lessee used that property within their trade. And there was also this one-off payment of premium that was received at the very beginning, at the granting of the lease. And what we then had to do was for the lessor, work out how much of that premium received would be treated as income. The other bit was treated as capital. That was outside the syllabus, so it doesn't matter. It was working out what the income component was. And what it was, was this bit. It was this calculation here, 51 minus N, the number of years of the lease, over 50 times the premium. But then looking at, as we're dealing with here, not the lessor, but the lessee, the trader who has acquired that property for use within his or her trade, we then divide out what the top line is, the income assessment on the lessor, we divide it by again n the number of years of the lease to get what would be the per annum figure, the annual trading profit deduction available in relation to the original premium paid when that lease was first granted to this lessee. So that is something uh, which I hope you recall, but if not, then you can quickly go back and remind yourself from uh, chapter three there, the end of chapter, or towards the end of chapter three, section six, I think it was, where we dealt with that particular issue. Again, though, distinguish here between the leasing of a car and the leasing of a property for use within that trade. These two are very, very different. The only other issue here that might be uh, again debited on the statement of profit or loss is that if they put the premium itself again as a debit on that uh, statement of profit or loss, that would be disallowed and this would be calculated instead as the annual allowable trading profit deduction. As also would be disallowed is any accounting amortization of the premium that was paid. So if it's the premium that's been debited to the statement of profit or loss, if it is amortization of that premium, then that is disallowed. We add that back. We get rid of that. And what we do instead is to establish via this calculation here, using that formula, what the annual trading profit deduction would be. Now, again, that's an annual trading profit deduction that we're talking in terms of. And on that basis there, do watch out to see that indeed that the uh, particular property involved has been owned through the or used throughout the entirety of that particular 12 month period. If we'd only acquired it halfway through the accounting period, then only six months worth, presuming it is a 12 month period, would be available. That calculation is a per annum figure. Look at the length of the accounting period. Look at within that accounting period, have we owned that property and used it within our trade during the entirety of that period? OK, in our next session together, therefore, as I've just said, it's back to uh, me in younger times. And that will pick it up again from that note K. Again, those rules have not changed and all with the rules that deal with the uh, example, example one that follows on, where the only difference is this is a much more recent date to the one that you'll see in the lecture. Enjoy.